Noon. Well, y'all sound like you're asleep. Glad to be in God's house. Uh, so if you'll stand with me, we'll turn to Hebrews 11, 1 and 7. Everybody's there, say amen. I'm waiting on y'all. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by, for by it, the elders obtain a good report. Through faith, we understand that the world's were framed by the word of God so that things which are, which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. <clears throat> Excuse me. And was not found, because God had translated for him, translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them who digi dig digitally seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to, to the saving of his house, by the which he command, condemned the wor world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. In part two of this series, we are going to talk about restoring the faith that the world has twisted and diluted, a world that wants to see the church fail. And it's not all the world's fault. The church is to blame just as much as the world is. If me standing up here is the only miracle you have seen, hold on. Because in this end time season, there will be an outpouring of his spirit. There will be restoration in the wake of destruction. Stretch your hands this land. Let's pray. Father, I come to you as your faithful and humble servant. I pray that you will fill this place with your spirit. Touch everyone to receive and do a work in our hearts and lives. And as always, we will give you the honor, the praise, and the glory for it in Jesus' mighty name. And all that loved him shouted, Amen. Amen. What is faith? Hebrews 11 and 1 tells us, Now faith is substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. This chapter deals with the vision and endurance of faith. Men and women of the Old Testament who endured tremendous shame and suffering rather than, rather than renounce their faith. Verse 1 is not a formal definition of faith, but rather a description of what faith does for us. It makes the things, it makes the things hoped for as real if, they were already, if we had already had them. And it provides unshakable evidence that the unseen spiritual blessings of the Christianity are absolutely certain and real. Faith brings the future into the present and makes the invisible seen. When you take a shower, you have faith. When you turn the water valve on, water will come out. You don't see the water, but you know it's there. Or when you turn the light switch on, that the lights will illuminate. And if the water don't come out or the lights don't come on, you either panic or start to get upset because it's not working. Something's wrong. The bill didn't get paid. There's a leak or the flow is restricted somehow. We see this in Daniel 10. He prays three times a day, talks to the Lord. But one day the flow stops. Daniel knows something's wrong. He fasted and prayed for 21 days. Then an angel tells him, the Lord heard you the first time. But the answer was delayed by demons. This doesn't mean that there 
if your shower stops working, there's demons in your pipes. It just means you forgot to pay your bill. No, I'm just kidding. Faith is confidence in a trustworthy God. It is not a leap in the dark. It's not limited to possibilities, but invades the realm of impossible. Some have faith. Some have uh, some have said faith begins where possibilities end. There are difficulties and problems in the life of faith. God tests our faith in the fire to see if it's real. George Muller, who was an evangelist, said difficulties are food for faith to feed on. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. There are almost 80 verses about faith. Why is faith so important? Not only is it a way of life, it is a weapon. Faith is a counterattack counter to doubt. I did not grow up in church. I don't trust easy. I lived a hard, young life. I have, I've only been serving him for about five years. He had to build my faith. He had to build my trust in him. In 2017, he told me to step out, and he would take care of me. The first time I heard this thought, I thought I was crazy. The second time, I started to listen. I left a job making 100000 a year. I left a career and a reputation that I had taken me 22 years to build. Three weeks into my leaving, man was at the church praying. It was a prayer meeting. I was, with the home, I was at home with the baby. I stepped out on the front porch and was like, we ain't never going to make it. There ain't no way. I'm going to have to go back. I turned around, and I did not say that out loud. I turned around and went back in the house. I said, I was just piddling. Amanda come home, and she says, I got a message for you. I said, oh, yeah, what's that? The Lord told me to tell you I didn't bring you out of Egypt for you to go back. Ooh, copy that, because I didn't speak that out loud. I went to a job making half of what I was making. Well, you know what, Lord? You, you take care of it. I ain't worried about it. Five months into that job, he pulled me out of it. Step out, and I will take care of you. Woo! Man, now we're going to do nothing. Where are we going? Step out. Okay, but you want to take care of Amanda. You have to deal with that. I can tell you in the 13 months that I did not have a traditional paycheck that all my bills were paid. Somebody was laid up, broke his knee. We helped him. We helped another family. We paid off a bill. We never lacked for anything. God is faithful. By faith we understand the world seeing the world says seeing is believing. God says believing is seeing. Jesus told Martha, Did I not say to you that if you would believe you would see? John eleven and forty. Apostle John wrote, These things I have written to you who believe that you may know. First John five and thirteen. In spiritual matters, faith proceeds understanding. In the life of Enoch, God must have made him a promise that he would go to heaven without dying. Until then, everyone else had died. But God promised and Enoch believed. It was the most sane and rational thing for Enoch to do. What is more reasonable than the creature believing his creator? Enoch, Enoch walked with God for 300 years and then was taken. Before he was taken, he left behind a mighty testimony that he pleased God. The life of faith always pleases God. He loves to be trusted. Without, without faith, it, faith, it is impossible to please him. No amount of good works can compensate for a lack of faith. After all that is said and done, when a man refuses to believe God, he is calling him a liar. How can God be pleased with people who call him a liar? Faith is the only thing that gives God his proper place and puts man in his. 
He glorifies God exceedingly because it proves that we have more confidence in his eyesight than in our own. Faith not only believes God exists, but it also trusts him to reward those who diligently seek him. There is nothing about God that makes it impossible for men to believe that difficulty is within the human will. Look at the faith of Noah. Noah's faith was based on God's warning that he was going to destroy the world with a flood. He could only find Noah faithful and righteous. Man, that's sad. I think uh, I read a commentator said that they estimated the world's population by that time was in the uh, hundred thousands. So out of that, you only find one dude that's faithful. But God, being full of grace, gave the world 120 years to turn from their wicked ways. Noah believed God and obeyed, preached the word of God and built the ark. Even through what God said to Noah, it did not make sense. There had never been a flood or rain fall for that matter. But Noah was faithful and trusted God. Noah was no doubt mocked and laughed for for what he was doing. But in the end, his faith was rewarded and his household was saved. Was commended by his life and his testimony and he became the heir of righteousness which is received on the basis of faith. Perhaps today we should look at the story of Noah as a reminder that in his days, only eight people were right with the Lord, and the rest of the world perished. And also remind us that Noah fought the good fight of faith for 120 years with his family in the Lord, despite all the name-calling, all the weird looks, and all of hell's torment. Noah knew what the Lord had told him and stuck to his guns, proving his faith to the Lord. We should all be that way in whatever the Lord has told you. Claim it. If the Lord said he's going to heal you, believe it. If he told you he'd provide or make a way, stand on it. Don't let the devil or anyone else tell you otherwise. Now, if we turn to the New Testament, we find the same kind of faith executed. The one with the issue of blood is a big one, as recorded in three of the Gospels. Matthew 9, 20 to 22, Mark 5, 25 to 34, and Luke 8, 43 to 48. This woman had suffered 12 years with this issue. At the end of her rope, she is sick and has been for 12 years. She has no more money. The doctors have drained all of her finances and left her worse rather than better. But the hope of recovery was all but gone. Someone told her about Jesus. She lost no time in finding him. Easing her way through the crowd, she touched the the border of his garment. Scholars believe the hem of his garment is a tassel that hangs from the robe of a rabbi. A tassel. Either way, she only wanted to touch the thread and the strings of his robe to be made whole. And it works. Think about that. After you've exhausted all your resources, all of them, you got no money, you're worse now than you when you started, everything's gone, hope's gone, you hear about one man. And you find him, and all you want to do is touch that. I I technically think probably what happened is the hope rised up, and as she struck out, she was full of vigor. As the, as the crowd got thick, she got weary. And she reached up, and that's all she touched. And she was made whole. As she, was tu- as she touched the hem of his garment, immediately the blood stopped, the bleeding stopped, and she was completely healed. She was going to slip away quietly, but the Lord would not let her miss the blessing of publicly acknowledging her Savior. That's all she wanted to do, slip in and touch. Jesus being aware that there was an outflow of divine power when she touched him, he asked, who touched me? It's kind of a weird statement. 
Wait a minute, who touched me? He knew who touched him. He asked in order to bring her forward in the crowd. Many people were touching him, and the disciples thought the question was silly. And we're packed in here like sardine cans, and everybody's bumping into you. Jesus has lost his mind. Nope. He wanted to bring her forth because that's what she wanted to do was slip off into the back. But there's a difference between the touch of physical nearness and the touch of desperate faith. It is possible to be ever so near to him without trusting him, but impossible to touch him by faith without his knowing it and without being healed. The woman came forward fear, fearing and trembling. She de- fell down before him and made her confessions to Jesus. Then he spoke words of assurance to her soul. Open confession of Christ is of tremendous importance. Without it, there can be little growth in the Christian life. As we take our stand boldly for him, he floods our souls with full assurance of faith. The words of the Lord not only confirm confirmed her physical healing, but also no doubt confirmed her blessing of soul salvation as well. Amanda was making dinner and boiling some water in the microwave. She went to get it out, and it spilled on her hand. You've probably seen this on Facebook if you're friends with her on Facebook. She's a nurse, so she reacted pretty fast. The problem was that she had a hold of it. So as she pulled it out of the microwave and it spilled, she had to hold it for a while before she set it down. I moved it out of the way. I knew it was hot. She's running water over, crying it hurts. We started to pray. Within 10 minutes, she said, I don't feel any pain. There wasn't even a mark on her hand. It wasn't even red. So me being the science nerd, I decided to test it because I knew if we told this story, somebody would say, well, you know, it really wasn't that hot. Yeah, well, I grabbed, the, I grabbed the container. I could tell you it was hot. So I used the same container, same amount of water, and cooked it for the same amount of time. When I took it out of the microwave and tested it, the temperature was at 200 degrees. Most adults will suffer third-degree burns if exposed to 150 degrees of water for more than for two seconds or more. Human skin is destroyed when temperature reaches 162 degrees. I can tell you it was hot. If you look up boiling water in a microwave, if you understand how a microwave works, it cooks from the inside out. They also say that you can find pockets of superheated water that exceeds the boiling point for a short burst because it's heated inside and it comes out. That's crazy. But I can tell you that water was hot. There should have been a marking, redness. It was nothing. We had faith that the Lord would move when we needed him to. I read a story about a girl with a tumor on her neck. She told her mother she was going to a meeting to be healed. She came forward and was prayed for. The next night she testified that the Lord healed her. She went home and told everyone how, how she was healed. And the next year, she came back to the meeting and testified, I was here last year, and the Lord wonderfully healed me. She went home and testified more strongly than ever how the Lord had healed her. She believed God. The third year of the meeting, the woman came back, and the people were talking about how big the tumor had become. She stood and testified, two years ago, I was here, and the Lord healed me. Isn't it grand to be healed by the power of God? That day somebody questioned her and said, people will think there's something wrong with you. They'll think that you're mad. Why don't you look in the mirror? You will see that the tumor is bigger than ever. The young woman went to the Lord about it and said, Lord, you healed me of this tumor two years ago. Won't you show all of them, all the people that you healed me? She went to bed that night peacefully. And when she woke up, The next morning, there was no tumor. There was no trace of the tumor. There was no tumor. God's word is everlasting to everlasting. His word cannot fail. God's word is true. And when we rest in its truth, 
what mighty results we can get. Faith never looks in the mirror. The mirror of faith is a perfect law of liberty. To the man who looks into this perfect law of God, all darkness is removed. He sees his completeness in Christ. There is no darkness in faith. Darkness is only in the natural. Darkness only lives when the natural replaces the divine. Oh, to have faith like this young woman. We don't see that kind of healings often, do we? Why? I believe the generation lacks the kind of faith. They had faith for salvation, but we don't have faith to move mountains. In Mark 6, 4 through 6, But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could do no mighty works, save that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went around to villages teaching him. It was then that Jesus saw that a prophet is generally given a better reception away from home than at home. They looked down on the Lord Jesus. What a commentary on a pride and unbelief of the human heart. The unbelief of the people amazed him. Such unbelief as this has huge consequences for evil. It closes the channel of grace and mercy so that only a trickle gets through the human lives in need. Isn't that the way we see it in this day and age? A trickle of grace and mercy of the Lord. As in the days of Noah, shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Try taking a shower with just a trickle of water coming out. I believe the issue with a lot of people today, even churchgoers, is that they have never had a real encounter with the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul had that encounter. He's having every Christian follower he can find killed. He thinks he is serving God's kingdom. One day, papers in hand to round up some more of, of the Christian followers and have them killed. He is struck blind by the Lord on the road to Damascus. That encounter changed his life, changed his focus. I had that encounter. A road to Damascus encounter. I never would have labeled it that until I went to CAMS. And um, I can't remember his name. Anyway, the bishop there that was uh, that would speak, uh, train us, He uh, that's what he kept saying. And every time I go there, every day, or not every day, but when we were assigned to go there, he would ask me, man, tell me your story. I'm like, dude, I already wrote it down for you. I typed it all out. He's like, no, 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 man, tell it to me. And he would say, man, you had a road to Damascus encounter. Woo, that's crazy. And he'd go on about his business. And then the next day we'd show up, he'd say the same thing. Man, tell me your story. <laughs> Dude, you already know the story. It changed my life. and changed my focus. What I thought mattered did not. And what I thought mattered, what I thought did not matter, did. But what brought me... To Christ was not a revival, was not a camp meeting. He found me. I was not looking for him. He was answering the prayers of some faithful people. It took them four years of praying and believing in God. And on a regular old Wednesday night, much like this one, I showed up and shocked everyone. Or better, or better put, God moved and shocked everyone. Why don't we see more moves of God like that? I believe because we put God in a box. Well, Lord, if you want to do this, I'll believe you. It sounds like a half-hearted prayer. Well, Lord, if you want to, if you want to heal me, okay. If it's your will, I believe. I don't believe, I believe in his will, and, I need to, I, and it needs to be his will and his way, no doubt. But he said in Mark 5, 35 and 36, while he yet spake, 
They became from the ruler of the synagogue's house, synagogue's house certain, which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou, master, any further? As soon as, soon as Jesus heard the word that, he, that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Be not afraid, only believe. I think most of us not only put God in a box and then carry him in our pocket like a good luck charm, but we also hold our faith to a certain limit. We go through life with God nicely tucked away, and we pull him out for rainy days or when the weather gets stormy. When we can't make it on our own. We use our faith the same way. We have faith that he saved us, and we have faith that he will move and heal in others' lives. But when we need a touch, we don't really believe. The devil has tricked us into thinking that we are not good enough or not worthy enough. And so when we, when we don't let our faith out or our God out, if we would only grab hold of the power that faith has, if we would only get God out of the box that we keep him in, let our faith come out for everything we pray for, then we would move mountains. Early in my Christian walk, the Lord led me to a man named Smith Wigglesworth. I couldn't get rid of him. The Lord would not let me just dismiss it. He was a preacher and a faith healer in the 30s and the 40s. I read a story of what, of what faith, I read stories of what faith and the power of God did in those times. Smith would pray for people and they would be healed. That stirred something in me, in my spirit. I began to wonder why we don't see those kind of things happening today. Smith was a man totally sold out to God. He took God at his word and believed that did something to my faith and my spirit. Smith believed his word so much that they said he read somewhere where the Lord did not like anybody winking, so he wouldn't wink at anybody. He wouldn't even wink to little kids. I left the gym one day on my way home. My back began to hurt. It was bad. Uh, it hurt so bad I was doubled over in the truck, and I got a call to come work on the truck, the semi. What I have to lift, I had to put my tools in, and they were in a plastic, a big plastic bin. It's probably about 100 pounds. So as I get out of the truck, I'm doubled over, and I'm walking, and I'm like, Lord, I ain't going to make it. I ain't going to be able to do it, but we need this money. I was out of work. Man, we need this money. So as I started up this steps to the house well, the first one would get worse the second one would be more intense I'm holding on to the rail I'm like Lord I don't understand I don't know what's going on I hit the third one I'm never going to make it I'm never going to make it we have four steps my, when, my first hits the, when my foot hit the first, uh, fourth one I said Lord you need to do something and you need to do it now I don't have time for this. I slung the door open, grabbed my tools, slung them in the back of the truck, got in the truck, drove an hour. I want to say I was mad, but I was kind of perturbed. I got to where I was going. I had to work on two trucks, and when you do a tune-up on a 60, you got to pull the valve cover, you got to sit up there, you got to pull the jakes. The jakes are probably a good 40 to 60 pounds by themselves. I'm up there, I tune both of them. I get down, I drive home. I realize it's about 3.30. My back ain't hurt me all day. <laughs> well, thank you, Jesus. Something recently just happened. Um, Miley and Tegan were playing in our bedroom, and there's a set of kettlebells, and they're on um, top of an exercise step. Milo was laying on the floor. I was in the office. Amanda was in the room with them. Tegan picked up the five-pound kettlebell. 
the weight of it shifted. She couldn't hold it. And when she leaned over, Milo was laying right there in the, in the five-pound kettlebell hit her in the head. Man, being a nurse, started freaking out, grabs her, starts praying. I hear the commotion. So I, I scream into the room, what's wrong? Tegan just dropped his five-pound kettlebell on Milo's head, on Milo's head. So I got the oil, and we went to praying. Milo's crying. About 10 minutes into it, we later, actually about five minutes after, after we had prayed, we anointed her with oil. We got her to calm down. She was still saying it was hurting. We laid her on the, we laid her on the couch. Within five more minutes, she was good. She was up playing and running around with a mark, not a scratch, no bruise, bruise or nothing, which is really funny because when we went to Tennessee and Tegan was playing with Brother George, she was playing peekaboo, and she caught her eye on the bedpost, and it blacked it. Did we pray for that? No. Uh, well, no, because technically at that time, we didn't really know what was going on. She was with George, and we were in the house somewhere. But the two contrasts, if you see the picture on Facebook, you can tell the difference. When we got home, my brain's my brain spinning. I'm like, man, let's think about this. There's that science nerd. So I found me a watermelon because I started to research how thick the human skull is. And they say that a watermelon is about the same density so I measured from the floor where Milo was at to Tegan. I pulled all my measurements. Pulled the measurement. I took the watermelon and I dropped the five pound kettlebell on it. What did it do? Put a where the kettlebell hit, it mushed it. It was a soft spot. So there should have been some damage. There should have been a bruise. There should have been something. That's what happens when Jesus answers. I believe if we all sold out to the Lord, we would see moves of God like that. Like we did in the early in the early church, blind received sight, lame walked, sick healed, the lost saved, the broken hearted made whole, and the dead rise. In closing, if you'll stand with me, I will leave you with this thought: Don't be afraid, only believe. This was a command of Jesus. This is a command of protection and the voice of encouragement the sound of salvation and the voice of Jesus when he came to earth to remove fear and doubt from our hearts and will fill us with his faith and eternal life. We read how Jesus performed miracles. Jesus turned the doubts of his followers to belief and he showed us the power of faith which each, which each Christian should follow. Faith is the key to the miracles and the door of heaven. We must be sold out. We must be burned out of ourselves and full of Christ. His return will soon be upon us. He did not leave a weak and helpless church. He's coming back for a church full of power and faith. It's up to us to stand in the gap for the faithless. It's up to us to show the world the true power of the church of the living God. So let's gather around his altars and get sold out. Father, I've delivered my heart today. I pray that it will find good ground. I pray that we all get sold out to your will and your way. I pray, Heavenly Father, that whatever you're going to do in this, in this age and hour, that this church will be a part of it. Pour your spirit out around these altars so we will have a true encounter and we will give you the honor, the glory, and the praise for whatever you do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.